Welcome to Meet the Press. Now I'm Chuck Todd here in Washington, where normally this is the first day of school. Everybody's in a good mood. Everybody's happy. They're taking pictures. The kids are running around Congress. Not today. We are watching a real-time rupturing inside the House Republican Caucus on a day when virtually all of the Republican Party's divisions and challenges are on full display for the whole political world to watch. Right now, these are live pictures from the House floor, where for the first time in 100 years, the House is battling it out on the floor over who will become Speaker. And it, it comes as the Republican candidate, Kevin McCarthy, uh, has lost a second vote for Speaker today, and they're about to start a third. We expect Steve Scalise to nominate him for Speaker this time. Uh, if, if and when this third vote proceeds, we will be here to cover that. On the first ballot, McCarthy came well short of the 218 votes needed to become Speaker, with a group of nearly 20 Republicans in the caucus's far-right faction, including members of the House Freedom Caucus, choosing to support someone else. In fact, McCarthy was not even the top vote-getter on the first ballot, with the newly minted Democratic leader, Hakeem Jeffries, winning every single vote from the caucus. He's the first Democrat to do that since 2007, by the way. On the second ballot, the anti-McCarthy uh, vote coalesced around Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan, who was, interestingly, the member who actually nominated McCarthy on the second ballot. Same 19 people who voted against McCarthy the first time voted for Jordan and against McCarthy the second time. So as for where things go from here, we actually don't know. None of us do. But by all indications, we may be here for a while. McCarthy's Republican critics have dug in, and so has Kevin McCarthy. Here's Florida Republican Matt Gates this afternoon. After opposing McCarthy on the first ballot, during his nominating speech for Jim Jordan as Speaker, taking direct shots at McCarthy in the process. I rise to nominate the most talented, hardest working member of the Republican conference who just gave a speech with more vision than we have ever heard from the alternative. I'm nominating Jim Jordan. Maybe the right person for the job of Speaker of the House isn't someone who wants it so bad. Maybe the right person for the job of Speaker of the House isn't someone who has sold shares of themselves for more than a decade to get it. And right now, you are hearing Steve Scalise, who has been whispered about as a potentially alternative candidate here. He is nominating McCarthy himself right now. The first person to nominate McCarthy was Elise Stefanik. The second person is Jim Jordan. This time, it is Steve Scalise. Now, McCarthy is dug in against his Republican critics. He vowed this morning to stand up for the speakership until the bitter end. I've been leader for four years. I came into this position, and we had less than 200 members. We are now sitting in the majority. We put forth to the American public a commitment to America. There's times we're going to have to argue with our own members if they're looking at for only positions for themselves, not for the country. We may have a battle on the floor, but the battle is for the conference and the country, and that's fine with me. Look, I, I have the record for the longest speech ever on the floor. I don't have a problem getting a record for the most votes for speaker, too. Thank you all. Behind closed doors and out in the open, today has been a circular firing squad at times between the different factions inside the GOP, with attacks being leveled that go far beyond Kevin McCarthy's bid for speaker. It's been a bit ugly, it's been mean, and it does not give a lot of confidence that any speaker, whoever they end up electing, could unite this GOP caucus and govern. According to the rules of the House, the chamber remains in a state of limbo until a speaker is chosen. Members can't even be sworn in until that happens. We don't even get to have the debate about whether George Santos should get sworn in today. Because that cannot take place yet until they elect a speaker. Today was supposed to be a day of celebration for House Republicans. They won the majority. Instead, the party's warts are on full display, factionalism, an inability to govern, and the presence of a disgraced member-elect in New York's George Santos. This is beginning the session in a state of turmoil for the grand old party. Joining me now to break all of this down on Capitol Hill, I got out of Italy. Also with me, Anna Palmer, co-founder of Punchbowl News. She's also an NBC News contributor. Here with me all hour, Sek Navin Nayak, president and executive director of the Center for American Progress Action Fund. Leanne Caldwell, Washington Post Live anchor, early 202 co-author. Brendan Buck, a former press secretary for Speakers Boehner and Ryan, an NBC News political analyst. He also worked for Kevin McCarthy for a time. And last but certainly not least is Republican strategist Brad Todd, who's worked for quite a bit, few of these members of Congress, and helped them get elected. Ali, let me start with you. Um, is three times a charm? Will the third vote work? 
everyone is waiting to see if that's the case, Chuck, but there's not a lot of confidence that this is going to be the ballot that actually gets it done for Kevin McCarthy, especially because in the intervening minutes while the clerk was making sure that the second ballot tally was accurate, members of our team have been talking to lawmakers here who are continuously dug in against McCarthy. They say they're not going to change their votes. McCarthy, of course, saying he's going to stay in for as many balloting rounds as this takes. He's comfortable making another the record here, he says this morning. So clearly, it's a question of who's going to blink first and if there is some other candidate waiting in the wings that could shake this whole thing loose. At this point, that's not what we're hearing. Mm -hmm. Instead, we're waiting to see if there are any things that can be leveraged or negotiated. But of course, McCarthy has been in these negotiations now for weeks, and Freedom Caucus members who are at the center of them right. seem to keep moving the goalposts, going in with an all or nothing approach to negotiating, even as McCarthy has offered a lot more compromise than most of his allies wanted him to. You know, Ali, I heard, I think it was Chip Roy said, hey, we just need to get in a room and work this out. Haven't they been in a room multiple times over the last two months? Yeah, they were in a room until very late last night, even. These meetings have been happening. It's not like there haven't been negotiations. Freedom Caucus members, of course, have tried to say that their demands weren't seriously considered until recently. They've used this phrase that they weren't considered until the 11th hour, until right on the cusp of these votes actually having to be cast on the floor. That's not actually the truth. And McCarthy has made several concessions, the most important of which is on the motion to vacate the chair, what it would take to oust a speaker. He he made concessions there that a handful of members, five of them, could make a move to oust a speaker. Freedom Caucus members and conservatives right. want that to be one member. That's not something that McCarthy says he could concede on. But if you're looking at the concessions that he's made so far, he's holding less cards than he had at the beginning of this, meaning there's less for him to have as leverage and a negotiating tactic. And you hear it in his tone, too, this morning and behind closed doors with his conference. He was defiant, instead seeming to turn right. his fire on the Freedom Caucus caucus members themselves publicly airing this family grievance. Meanwhile, the Democrats, uh, while you were talking right now, we were showing a, the House floor. Pete Aguilera just uh, yeah. nominated Akeem Jeffries, and Democrats got excited about that. We were waiting to see if anybody else was going to get nominated uh, at this point. And so we'll wait to see if something, yep, it looks like one more person <laughs> is getting up here to nominate. Why don't we dip into this um, and take a listen to who's being nominated here? How many times have we been down here giving speeches and there's not a soul in the chamber? Yet this is what it takes to get 440, 435 people in the chamber and have an actual debate. The American people are watching, and that's a good thing. What we're doing is exercising our rights to vote and have a debate and have a discussion about the future of this country through the decision of choosing a speaker. This is not personal. It's not. This is about the future of the country. This is about the direction of the country. American people who are looking at this body and wondering why we can pass $1.7 trillion bills that are unpaid for. They can just slide in $45 billion for Ukraine but not pay for it. $40 billion for emergency spending and not pay for it. 10% increase in defense spending. 6% increase in non-defense spending and not pay for it and not do a thing except put language in a bill that prohibits our ability to use the money to secure the border. That bill gets rammed through, and we know exactly how it gets rammed through, because the defense world and the non-defense world come together and say, you know what, we're going to cut a deal, and we'll all go to the mics, and we're all going to give speeches, and the American people are the big losers. That's what happens. We know that's what happens. The Rules Committee sits up there and passes a bill, sends it to the floor, and we have no debate on the floor of this body. We haven't been able to offer an amendment on the floor of this body since May of 2016. The former leader and I have discussed this right here. That's true. But the fact is, this place has to change. It has to change. And the change comes by either adopting rules and procedures that will make us actually do our job, or it comes from leadership. And people ask me, what do you want? I want the tools or I want the leadership to stop the swamp from running over the average American every single day. 
We can't keep doing this. I'm going to sit here until we figure out how to stop spending money we don't have. I don't want any more empty promises. I don't want any more, oh, don't worry, trust us, we'll do it. I want to know that we're going to be able to exercise our rights as a member of this body to stand up for the American people and actually fix this country. And it's not going to happen when we use our men and women in uniform in defense and wrap ourselves around that and then spend more money that we don't have, weakening that defense, weakening our country in the process. But that's what we just did. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am asking for us to come together and figure out how to solve these problems. And to do that, I'm going to do what I did my very first act as a member of Congress or as a congressman-elect and nominate Jim Jordan for speaker. Now, Jim has said he doesn't want that nomination, and Jim has been down here nominating Kevin, and I respect that. All right, joining again, me now is no a Republican from California, story. Congressman David Valadeo. He is a Kevin McCarthy supporter. Uh, I wanted to hear uh, Congressman Roy there. He's been one of the more vocal um, foes of, of uh, Mr. McCarthy. I figured you might want to hear what he had to say, too. So let me just start with that, Congressman. What happens now? In our process that we have, closed-door meeting, where people are able to debate the rules, the rules passed out of a Republican-controlled conference. Uh, I, I don't remember a single no vote. Uh, and then they continue to debate, they continue to push. And, they, and then even today, in our conference meeting, the simple question was asked, what do you want? And there was no direct answer. And so this is just a game to them. And the reality is, is the American people want us to get to work, and this is just slowing down the process. And they won't even tell us exactly what they want. They give these really long answers about platitudes and, and uh, solutions with cut spending. But we have to be sworn in. We have to put people on committees. Right. And we have to start doing our job. And unless we get doing that, we're just going to sit here and scream at each other. Did you hear a specific ask from uh, Congressman Roy there? There was no ask uh, on the floor. There was no ask in committee this uh, or in conference this morning. And then again, there was uh, a process that played out in uh, the rules debate that we had a few months back. We had a debate. We had votes. And all those uh, rules changes passed with unanimous support. And, and Congressman, none of this was that close, correct? Whether it was the vote for McCarthy or the vote for these rule packages, we're talking 75-25 percentage-wise here, correct? Absolutely. You're absolutely right. It was actually higher numbers than that. Uh, McCarthy got upwards of 85 percent of the vote in our conference. So what do you attribute this? It looks like stubbornness, right? I'm not a member of this conference. I'm watching. It looks like you've got 19 folks who simply want to prove that they can deny the speakership of McCarthy. They've made their point. Um, now what? Is it time to move on? I mean, I know nobody wants to capitulate to anybody here. How long do you play this out? We keep playing, and McCarthy said this morning he's willing to set a record, and I think the current record now is from the 1850s at 133 ballots. It'll be interesting if we get to that point. Uh, but the reality is is they're nominating a person that is nominating Kevin McCarthy. I mean, if that is anything, that speaks uh, I mean, volumes about the situation that we're dealing with right now. They're nominating a person that doesn't want the job and is supporting the person that the majority of us support. Do you feel confident that everybody that's supporting McCarthy is working to get McCarthy elected, by the way? I do. I absolutely do. Everything I've seen for over the last few months in the process of, of closed-door meetings, uh, just talking to fe uh, fellow members on the floor, and even today during conference, the vast majority of the people were cheering. And when McCarthy said he doesn't care if this is one ballot or a thousand ballots, he's going to fight it and continue to fight it. And that got a standing ovation. And it wasn't just a, a, a weak standing ovation. It was a strong standing ovation from the majority of the conference. So do you believe the burden is on McCarthy to get these votes, or do you think the burden um, is on these 19 folks to prove they can win more than 19 votes? Well, I mean, they've got to show that they get more than 19 votes, but they also have to show the American people what they're fighting for. If they can't tell us, their fellow Republicans, in a closed-door conference meeting of just Republicans, when asked directly by McCarthy and others, and the whole room started to scream at him, what do you want? And they can't give you a direct answer, the simple, oh, we sent you a letter on December 8th but they can't tell us what they actually want, they've got a problem on their hands. And I think that they're the ones that are under a lot of pressure, and you can see it because they're getting frustrated. And now they're nominating someone, again, who does not want the job and is supporting McCarthy. Uh, a few weeks ago, Don Bacon, uh, a Republican from Nebraska, floated. He said, you know, we're not going to sit here all day. You know, the moderate Republicans who are very pro-Kevin McCarthy, 
you know, they're, they're not interested in watching and I, uh, whether I want to, whether you want to be in that same group, I'll let you decide, but they don't want to see, you know, see themselves being hijacked by the extremists. Is there a point where you would work for a compromise speaker with moderate Democrats? So I've heard what Bacon has said out there publicly, but I've had a lot of conversations uh, with him in the room and others. Uh, I've never heard that, uh, mm -hmm. that brought up as an actual uh, legitimate thing that's going to be done. Every single one of us has been very hard uh, on the line that we are sticking with McCarthy no matter what and no matter how long it takes. Um, I know that Bacon has said a few things publicly, mm -hmm. but I've never had that conversation with him privately, and I've never seen him bring that up uh, in some of our closed-door meetings. Uh, how many more votes would you do tonight? And when would you adjourn to try to do some backroom conversations? We got nowhere else to go. We haven't even been sworn in yet. So uh, I'll have food brought in if I get hungry. And, <laughs> and there's a restroom right off the floor. We'll be good. Hey, speaking of swearing in, should George Santos be sworn in? Well, I mean, he's going to be sworn in. I think the Supreme Court decided in 69 uh, that we have no ability to stop him from being sworn in. Obviously, he's got a lot of questions that need to be answered. And uh, I'm sure Are you that sure about that? <laughs> the, the House can decide who to seat, can't they not? No, I, I believe in 1969, if I'm not mistaken, I looked it up the other day, uh, there was an actual fight on the Supreme Court about seating a member of Congress, and uh, the Supreme Court decided that uh, the Constitution says that members of Congress right. are elected from their state, the state sends them to the federal government, and we have to seat them. I mean, can we expel them? Yes. Can we subject them More to ethics uh, investigation? All those things can happen, but from what I've seen, we have no ability to stop him from being sworn in. But I expect he's going to have a lot of questions when all this is over. Okay, so you feel like you have no choice but to see him, but you'd be open to expelling him, ethics committee, all those, all those ideas, all those avenues? I'm open to uh, having that conversation. I mean, obviously, I, I've been so focused on this McCarthy of stuff, course. I haven't taken a long time to see what he's actually said and done. Uh, I'm in California, but um, obviously there's a lot of frustration, and obviously it's, uh, he's admitted to a lot of lying. Now we need to see if he's actually broken any actual rules. So. Well. As somebody who is at the end of the alphabet, I know what it's like to have to wait and wait and wait for your name called. So you still have about 20 more minutes before you got to get in there. I don't think we're, I think we're still on the C's and D's. So you should be in good shape. Congressman Valadeo, thanks for taking a few minutes. Anytime. Thanks for having me. You got it. Uh, let me bring in, I got my a tremendous panel here. I think I still have Anna Palmer, who's uh, in, uh, uh, on, the ca on Capitol Hill right now. Anna, very quickly... Any behind backroom stuff you're getting word about, or are we just all observers now in this reality show? We are really in unprecedented territory, honestly. I mean, I think we, one of the things we were looking for in that second vote was, was there going to be any momentum by Kevin McCarthy to show that he could pick off some of the, the early 19 uh, that voted against him? That did not happen, right, and actually solidified. I think the other very interesting thing. Yes, of course, you did have Jim Jordan kind of giving a vigorous uh, defense of Kevin McCarthy, but he didn't say, don't vote for me. He didn't He didn't go that far, right? And so, if anything... He, Is that notable to you? Do you think that... I, do you think do he should have? Were people I, I expecting that? I don't know whether that? he should have or, right. or not, but I do think it's notable in so much as he gave a vigorous, mm -hmm. and, and he's a, he, he has a very commanding, powerful ability to speak and to certainly, he's one of the original leaders of the Freedom Caucus, which is important to remember. Um, and he also, for a long time, had a bad relationship with Kevin McCarthy. Right. That has mended over the past couple of years. He says that he wants to be Judiciary Committee Chairman, um, but he didn't say... I'm not going to do it. Don't vote for me. If you support me, you should support Kevin, right? I mean, I think yeah. he didn't go that far, and I do think that that is notable. I, I, I'm not listening in on the roll call, but I'm guessing we haven't quite gotten finished the siege yet because we're only at four Jordan votes. Leon Caldwell, um, Jim Jordan couldn't get 218, though, could he? I mean, let's be realistic. I don't know, honestly. Um, it would be hard because um, then you have a moderate problem mm -hmm. with Jim Jordan. Right. Um, but Jim Jordan has also done a lot over the years to ingratiate himself with many members of the conference. Um, he is an alternative. I thought that when uh, Bobert in the first round, because she was declining, declining to say who she was going to, who her alternative was, the fact that she voted for Jim Jordan was a huge sign to mm -hmm. me that that is kind of the preferred candidate for a lot of these people. But the fact that Jim Jordan was, is Kevin McCarthy's secret weapon. And there we are. We just got the fifth, and that's always Yeah, there. so there it is. Mr. Cloud. The fact that Jim Jordan is McCarthy's secret weapon, he has the conservative bona fides. He is the one who can try to, to, to bring conservatives along to McCarthy's position, and that changed nothing. And so McCarthy is running out of room and running out of options. I don't think any more concessions have been med, met or made over yeah. the past couple rounds. Yeah. 
Um, but so McCarthy's strategy is just to wear them out. We are literally, since she finished talking, Brendan, it's official. He's now lost the third ballot here. At what point does the establishment wing of the party say, look, we can't risk not having one of our own speaker? And like Kevin, I, I saw Pete Sessions' comments uh, in between the second vote and the third vote where he said, well, it looks like 16 of these 19 aren't moving. Byron Donalds, who also voted for McCarthy, said, looks like McCarthy doesn't have the votes. I mean, I assume this third vote, is there any good news for McCarthy if he doesn't lose supporters here? Um, yeah, obviously, the, the it looks like the third vote's going to end up just like the second vote. So, Certainly you know, it looks we're, like we're, it. We're, we're at a staring contest yeah. at this point, which, you know, that's, that's fine. Um, I, I do think that uh, Kevin McCarthy saying he's ready to go to 134 ballots uh, is fine. The question is, is everybody else willing to do that? Pete are they, Sessions. Are right, they, are yeah. they, they going to tire of this? Do they have the same resolve? That mm -hmm. Kevin has a lot of allies. He, he's very popular across the conference. But I don't know how deep it is. Well, how this much, is it for him. Like, he lose this bid for... It's nothing left. It's, no, yeah. He's, yeah. He's, he's, he's His done career it. is he's done. He's done at this point. And I don't think you can really have a conversation about alternatives until he comes to that conclusion that he can't get there. I don't think anybody can really emerge mm -hmm. until Kevin McCarthy says, I'm giving up and I'm endorsing someone else. It doesn't surprise me. Jim Jordan is, is not a crazy idea. If Kevin McCarthy were to say... Could he get to 18? If Kevin McCarthy said, this is who I want all okay. my supporters to go to, and I think he's much more likely to do that for Jim Jordan than he is for Steve Scalise. Interesting. Uh, Brad, you, you know, during uh, all of our uh, briefings in October, very quietly... All the Republican groups are saying, well, you know, this is why, you know, McCarthy needs, got to get to 230 members, got to get to 230, somewhere between 230 and 235. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't get there. And this is why. Mm -hmm. Well, it, you know, I would, if I was Kevin McCarthy, I would look at it and say, I lost 31 votes six weeks ago in the conference. I've lost 19 today. This is, <laughs> this is slow going, but we're making progress. Uh, you know, because there obviously so are people... So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> so there are, well, there, right now there's no one else that you can plausibly say has a better chance at 218 than him. And or at least enough 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 votes to become speaker. I mean, if 38 Democrats decide they're too tired to vote at 2 a.m. tonight, Kevin McCarthy has the votes right now. I mean, every two Democrats at least takes yeah. the number down one. And that's part of what you have to calculate in these scenarios. And if I'm Kevin McCarthy, I don't look at any of these other names that are, be, that are being thrown out and say, OK, they can get more votes than I can. You don't think I mean, Patrick McHenry could? I, he seems to be as like uh, of. Uh, yeah, I've joked for months. I've been holding a Steve Scalise ticket. But if I could live bet this right now, uh, to, to borrow the words of too many of these gambling sites that are out there, I might be live betting McHenry. Well, but one thing that's going on here is this is not just a referendum on Kevin McCarthy. This is a referendum on do these 19 By people the way, a little breaking news, Byron Donalds voted for Jordan this time. One vote de different. One right. vote but the point is, he voted McCarthy twice. But a lot of members of the Republican conference don't want this particular group of 19 to run the rest of them. Right. And so this is not just a choice of McCarthy. It's also a choice of how much power do you give this 19. All right. But they will. The Democrats have some power here, as Brad pointed out. They could at least choose to lower the threshold for McCarthy at some point. I don't see why they, like, you know, I think Hakeem Jeffries sees this as his first big test as the party leader. leader. Party leader. Yeah. And it, it's not a hard threshold. You've got to sit there and let the other party continue to implode. And I think they view the next two years as the job. That if they can't show discipline for a week here, then what's the point? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think yeah. it's a little bit harder today because their families are there. They're right. waiting to be sworn in. There are other personal dynamics. But I, I think they, they do their job and, and make them get to an 18. Well, House moderates were telling me the past 24 hours that this is part of their plan. They're calling it the war of attrition, that mm -hmm. hopefully Democrats are the ones that tire. But Democrats are telling me that leadership does not want them yeah. to leave their seats, that they are not going to help Kevin McCarthy get the speakership. One, one other thing to note, the, the, the folks who are against Kevin McCarthy, the, the, one of their big demands is to create a committee that would take a lot of jurisdiction away from Jim Jordan. Uh, in the Judiciary Committee. They want to commit... Oh, they want a separate new investigation. Yes, to look into an right. investigatory committee, look into the Department of Justice. That tells you they don't have a real plan for how to get a speaker elected because they're chosen person that they want. They'd eviscerate his, his committee. Yeah. So I, I'd, I, I've yet to see from these 19 members what their path out of it is, other than they don't but, want Kevin McCarthy. But ask not Brendan. A path out. He's been dealing with that. They, they've, been, <laughs> they've been running... It's like the marching band that has the drum major in the... Is it an animal house where they lead into the brick wall? Freedom Cox has been doing that to you. Yeah. Yeah, and, and people, are, people are saying, well, they don't have an alternative. I actually think it's the smarter strategy not to have an alternative. The, the, their strategy is just to embarrass Kevin McCarthy to they've, death. Well, they've succeeded. Yeah, and, and just make him sit there and take these votes 
face the indignity over and over again until he gives up. And then they'll figure. And that's what they've been saying. They'll figure out an alternative at that point. That's probably actually the best strategy. It, it is their play, but I think they risk alienating everyone else. In they've game. already done yeah. that. Yeah. Anna Palmer, Byron Donalds. I mean, look, to me, any movement uh, is news. And the fact that the movement is away from McCarthy seems to be a bad sign. It certainly isn't a good sign. I mean, I think if you're talking about the third, um, you know, uh, vote here right now and looking at the numbers, I just don't, to the point that I think that has been made by a couple of the, of the other folks in the panel, I mean, where is the momentum? Where is his argument that, you know, just because he wants to stick around and take a bunch of votes, I mean, right. none of the business of the House can get done, and it only becomes more embarrassing uh, for House Republicans, right, and their their nascent majority. I mean, how are they going to even think about coming together uh, and, and trying to do just the, the minimum of business of keeping the lights on, uh, potentially raising the debt limit? I mean, yeah. this is really, I think, it's just a coming, a, a straight stumble and fall out of the out of the starting blocks. Here. Uh, if you're Chuck Schumer or Joe Biden or Hakeem <laughs> Jeffries, you couldn't have asked for a better first day of Congress mm -hmm. uh, for the Democrats, the way, the way this is playing itself out so far. I'm going to sneak at a break. You guys have promised not to go anywhere, so nobody's going anywhere. Hopefully we're going to get through the L's, because we get through the L's. I think I have another Republican member of Congress who's going to be uh, on here to tell us what he thinks. So let's see where we are after this break. Unprecedented story we are watching before our eyes. A once in a hundred years event. Multiple ballots for Speaker of the House. We're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Uh, we are in the middle of an historic day in Capitol Hill. And it's not only in the House side, as we've been discussing. It's been chaos in the House where Kevin McCarthy was not elected leader on the first or second, and it appears now the third uh, ballot, and it's the first time in a century that that's happened. So we'll see what the final vote count is on the third side. But over on the Senate side, the start of the pomp and circumstances of the start of the new Congress went as planned. The Republican caucus remains in the hands of Senator Mitch McConnell, who is now officially the longest-serving Senate leader from either party in that chamber. He surpassed the record set by former Democratic Senator Mike Mansfield of Montana. McConnell acknowledged that legacy today. Then there have been leaders who rose to the job through lower key, behind the scenes styles. And that, Madam President, is how Senator Michael Joseph Mansfield of Montana became the longest serving Senate leader in American history until today. Let me bring in our NBC News presidential historian, Michael Beschloss. So, Michael, uh, Mike Mansfield, Mitch McConnell, what are their similarities? What are the differences? Well, ideologically, Mike Mansfield was liberal, born in Boston, served in Montana, very labor-oriented, uh, had a lot of knowledge about the world, interested in Japan, uh, very, very quiet. One would say not a weak speaker, but someone who tried to find consensus. Uh, I shouldn't say speaker, leader. I yeah. should say majority leader. We've been thinking about the House all day. <laughs> uh, and in, in the case of Mitch McConnell, someone who has been extremely strong and trying to keep his side in line, but today an extremely frustrated man because, as you know, he expected to be there as the majority leader today, and he will say to himself that I'm not the majority leader because Donald Trump, whom I loathe, this is McConnell talking, mm -hmm. uh, chose a bunch of candidates in key states who could not win. If that had not happened, the Republicans would be in the majority of the Senate. So I'm sure he's very angry and very frustrated. Uh, let's and put the uh, the House battle here in context. You know, it's actually we haven't had this kind of tumult in 100 years, but we used to have this tumult all the time from about 1880 to 1920. It actually seemed like it was constantly uh, a battle of figuring out who was going to lead the House. Right. Didn't no, have that's cable exactly news. right. <laughs> uh, I agree. I'm sorry, did I interrupt? No, 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 go ahead. Uh, well, what I'm thinking of is that the difference, I think you'll agree with me as someone who knows a lot about history, is the difference from, between now and those days is that this is all taking place on TV. We're all talking right. about it. People are watching it in other, other venues. And if those, this goes on for three days, that will seem like an eternity. You know, imagine if we were in a situation like 1855 and 1856 when it took... Nathaniel Banks, as you know, 133 ballots took two months. In today's world, that not only would seem to be a party that cannot govern America, 
if they could not come to a decision that right. quickly. But the other thing is that we de depend on Congress to do all sorts of things that uh, have to do with our national security and, and our economic health. We can't afford mm -hmm. to have Congress or the House tied up for two months. Um, and before I'm going to I'm going to do a little dip my toe in the George Santos story here in a minute. Um, any historical parallels that come to your mind? None. Uh, this guy is in a category of his own. Uh, I know people lie. I have never seen a liar like this in my life, especially elected to Congress, someone who is so shameless. And I would begin to say that this is so extreme that I don't think, you know, you hear this a lot in politics, as you know, Chuck. This is a guy who doesn't seem to know the, the difference between truth and lies. Uh, and I know we make a lot of jokes about politicians, yeah. but this is so extreme, yeah. the House is going to have to do something. Yeah, I think only, I don't even think John Lovitz could do this guy right. No, I no. mean, you know, Morgan Fairchild. Sorry, I'm going really old with that reference. <laughs> uh, Michael Beschloss, uh, great to catch up with you. Happy New Year to you, sir. Pleasure. Same to you, Chuck. All right, let's do a quick update on where we stand. So right now, the third vote is currently underway in the House floor for Speaker. This is going to have to go to a fourth ballot because there's already enough votes to prevent anybody from getting majority. Uh, 12 votes, I believe, on the screen right now, as you see there for Jordan. And I'm guessing we are somewhere in the M's right now. But among the Republicans who are supporting Kevin McCarthy is the much talked about incoming member of Congress, George Santos. He has voted for McCarthy twice. We'll see if he votes for him a third time. The congressman elect from Long Island admitted to embellishing parts of his resume. He has yet to be sworn in because no one can be sworn in until the House speakership is resolved. Santos arrived on Capitol Hill as the focus of multiple investigations into his background, including probes by the Nassau County DA and the U.S. Attorney's Office in Brooklyn. And according to the New York Times, Brazilian authorities plan to revive a fraud case against Santos stemming from a stolen checkbook more than a decade ago. NBC News has not confirmed that reporting. NBC News has re uh, directly reached out to George Santos, but has not received a response. Antonia Hilton has been in George Santos' home district today. She's in the town of Mineola, New York, at the train station there. And Eddie, I'm just curious, Antonia, what do the average constituents think? Is, is this sort of part, they think all members of Congress lie, par for the course, or do they appreciate, I guess, the uniqueness of this set of lies? That was a really delicate phrasing there, Chuck. I think they appreciate the uniqueness, the strangeness of this all. I have yet to meet someone who is excited that George Santos is set to become their congressman today. And I've been here since early this morning. Mm -hmm. And mostly, you know, the, the emotions range from outright anger and outrage at all of these lies, and then just sort of disgust and exhaustion. A lot of people talking about this as a symptom of a broader disease in our politics, you know, they all kind of acknowledge that this isn't the first time a politician has fibbed, but these lies are so incredibly strange. I mean, they range from embellishments about his career background, his educational background, to really bizarre and offensive stuff like exaggerating Jewish heritage right. or lying that his mother died in the 9-11 terrorist attacks, something that most New Yorkers or maybe all New Yorkers really cannot fathom. Take a listen to some of the conversations I've had. The bar seems to be set so low in the last few years um, since Trump. It seems like lying is almost acceptable these days. And um, it's, it's really a sad, it's a very sad thing for our society that um, today he's, everyone knows how much he lied. And yet he's, um, I think he's going to probably be sworn in and just um, unacceptable. He will be in two years. In the meantime, there's nothing we can do about it. You don't think voters here will have his back at the end of two years? No, absolutely not. Unless he does something miraculous and really helps us. But I don't think so. I think a little bit that the system is broken and that we have to do a better job of screening and qualifying the candidates that run for office and not just on party lines. And a lot of the folks I've been talking to, Chuck, they just feel powerless now. Yeah. There's no recall mechanism here in New York. So they are saying that in two years, their best option right now is just to wait to get a chance to vote him out. And the only other thing that could possibly happen is, I guess, Republicans could expel him from the yeah. House. That would take a two-thirds majority vote in the House. And it doesn't look likely with this very narrow majority. So people here are kind of resigned to their fate. Right the now. honorable thing to do would be to resign and run again if he truly believes he should resign and run again. Uh, it's the only way he'd have a chance to actually have a political career if he wants one after this. I doubt he'll go that road either. Antonia Hilton, 
uh, at Mineola today. Thank you for doing that work. Much appreciated. We're going to sneak in another break ahead. I'm going to talk to soon to be sworn in. Well, we think soon. Republican member of Congress, Mike Lawler from New York State, by the way, on where he would like to see the party go next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Well, the roll call is on the ends, which means my next guest is now wired and ready to talk to me because he's in the L's. Congressman-elect Mike Lawler, a Republican who flipped the seat uh, in New York after defeating DCCC chair Sean Patrick Maloney. Congressman-elect, I thought I'd be calling you congressman by now, but it's still congressman-elect. Thank you for giving me a few minutes. So we're up to 14 votes now for somebody other than Kevin McCarthy among Republicans. It means we're headed to a fourth ballot no matter what. Look, you're new to this, uh, but you've been in legislatures before. How much is this par for the course for you, and how much of this is, like, what have I gotten myself into? Well, I was joking with somebody earlier. The uh, minority of the state assembly in Albany doesn't seem so bad right now. But, uh, <laughs> you know, look, uh, Kevin McCarthy has earned the right uh, to lead the Republican conference and to be Speaker of the House. Uh, he has the overwhelming support of a majority of the conference. Uh, he earned 85 percent of the vote in our November conference elections. And again today, uh, he continues to receive broad support from the conference. Uh, ultimately, I do think cooler heads will prevail and he will be uh, Speaker of the House. Um, and I support him fully. Uh, the bottom line here is this. He has negotiated in good faith with the House Freedom Caucus and members from throughout the conference to address their concerns, especially with respect to the House rules. Uh, he has made over 20 changes uh, to the rules. Uh, and at the end of the day, people need to learn to take yes for an answer. Uh, and I think we need to get to work on behalf of the American people. Uh, the American people did not want one party rule to continue here in Washington. They wanted balance and common sense restored. Uh, and so far, uh, some of these folks within the House Freedom Caucus are yeah. proving themselves incapable of governing. We need to get to work and we need to unify behind Kevin McCarthy. For what it's worth, uh, Congressman-elect, we're up to 91 percent of Republicans are supporting, House Republicans are supporting Kevin McCarthy. 91 yep. percent are supporting him on this vote. So let me ask you this. We've gotten some reporting that indicates that there have been a group of members who have, are pleading with Kevin McCarthy, don't give in to this. Don't drop out. Because the fear is if you capitulate to these 19 members, or now 20, um, then who really runs the House? Well, listen, I, as I've said uh, many times, I'm supporting Kevin, whether it's on the first vote, the second vote, the third vote, or the hundredth vote. Uh, and I think uh, Leader McCarthy has made it very clear to all of us uh, that he is not backing down, and nor should he. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the conference supports him, and we are not going to be held hostage by a handful of members. We do not live in a dictatorship. We live in a democracy. And, you know, the majority rules for a reason. And so we need to move forward. We need to get about the work. And the only people winning here today are Joe Biden, Chuck right. Schumer, and Hakeem Jeffries, because every day wasted here uh, is a day that we are not getting about the business of our agenda, and that's the commitment to America. It's reining in the reckless spending. It's increasing domestic production of energy. It's securing our border. Uh, we're not doing those things so long as there's not a speaker. So you're uh, you're on the front lines. You're going to be the one uh, facing probably more money than you know you and about 20 other House Republicans here. You're going to be on the front lines. How do you explain to an independent voter what's happening today? Look, I I, uh, I was on the front line in this election. Right. You know, there was over 25 million dollars spent on my race uh, on both sides. Uh, and I defeated the chair of the DCCC in a district Joe Biden won by 10 points that has 70,000 more Democrats than Republicans. I'm proud of my record and my ability to communicate with voters within my district uh, with respect to the issues uh, and with respect to my own conduct. So uh, I am not too concerned about it. At the end of the day, uh, we are going to unify. We will move forward uh, and we will elect Kevin McCarthy as speaker and we will get about the work that needs to be done. Uh, this is an unfortunate uh, hiccup in that, but we will move forward. And I think people will understand uh, and appreciate the fact that we are not capitulating or kowtowing to a handful of members. Uh, 
George Santos is a member of the New York delegation. Um, I know you've said, you know, obviously you don't think he should be. But do you think the House Republicans should actively figure out a way to oust him? Look, his election was certified, so he is going to be seated. We can't do anything uh, until there's a speaker. Uh, so the bottom line here is this. He is seated. He's uh, here voting uh, today. Uh, but as I have said, there are multiple investigations going on, uh, federal, state, and local, and he needs to cooperate with every single one. Uh, these are serious allegations that have been leveled, uh, much of it corroborated. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately he's going to have to make a decision uh, whether or not he can uh, do his job. But this is uh, serious, and the investigations will, uh, you know, conclude at some point. And, uh, I'm sure there will be determinations made uh, when those investigations are complete. And going back to the speaker fight here, is there ever a moment where you think it's worth working with moderate Democrats to find a compromised Republican? No, look, I got elected uh, to end one party rule. I do not believe uh, that Democrats should be in complete control of our government. Uh, it doesn't work wherever it's been practiced, whether it's Washington or Albany uh, or New York City. We see the results, a 41-year record high on inflation, surging crime, skyrocketing energy costs, and a porous southern border. So no, I don't think that is the appropriate path forward. Uh, we do need to have balance and common sense in government. Uh, and one-party rule just does not work. Uh, Congressman-elect Mike Lawler from New York State. Again, the district that uh, was once represented by San Patrick Maloney, now by Mr. Lawler. Appreciate you coming on spending a few minutes with me here. Thanks, Chuck. Thank you. Uh, I got my panel back. Ali Vitale is back with me on the Hill. Ali, let me start with you. Um, we, saw, we saw a change there with Donald, so that's one more vote for the opponents of McCarthy, one less for McCarthy. Yeah. You picking up anything behind the scenes? Look, at this point, you don't want to be losing votes if you're Kevin McCarthy, but Byron Donald was actually at a camera right next to me explaining why he changed his vote. And in his words, he says that keeping people on the floor, trying to wear them out, is going to have the opposite effect for him. He wants to see them adjourn and start having more conversations mm -hmm. about the path forward. And in his words, McCarthy doesn't have the votes, but nobody has the votes right now. At a certain point, though, Chuck, these conversations have been happening for weeks among members that are reluctant yeah. to, to support McCarthy, you can't just keep talking yourselves in circles. And today was supposed to be a who blinks first moment on the floor. Would yeah. these people actually continuously oppose McCarthy? It seems like at this point the answer is yes, though I will say members have been advised that there will be another vote after this one. So they're going to stay at it at least for a fourth ballot round. Yeah, here. and it certainly looks like they're having a harder time getting people now to show up for these votes. They look like they still got about 75 non responders there. For this third ballot, I, I think there's a lot of uh, bathroom and food breaks yeah. taking place. The stragglers really drawing this out. There were yeah. a few in the last ballot round, too. They ultimately came back before votes could be counted. But look, the numbers of who actually shows up are really important. Because as you well know, that magic number 218 is a theoretical number if the total number of people voting isn't 434. All right. Well, uh, Ali Vitale, I know you're doing some reporting. Thank you. All right, guys. What happens? I, it's, I'm, we're, we're watching the what floor. We're watching the floor. I find it really interesting that Kevin McCarthy is still on the floor. His, his top, see, but I'm spotting a couple of his top mm -hmm. aides are still on the floor, sitting. Why down. does that surprise you? Well, I would think at this point there may need to be having some conversations with members to kind of figure out a, a path ahead. Um, first of all, it's, it's unusual to have the not waiting speaker actually on the floor. John Boehner and Paul Ryan would wait in the ceremonial office. I think Kevin is trying to show that he's with the team and he's going to mm -hmm. tough it out on the floor. But that means he's not trying to make a deal with anybody, at least directly. Maybe some of his, his team is. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems to me, and his body language is just, I'm going to wait this out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit here as long as it takes. But, man, that's, that's discouraging if, if uh, a member who was with him is growing tired and saying, I'm protesting the fact that we're on the floor. Brad? I think he's on the floor because he wants anybody who <laughs> wants to come to him has to do it in public. Uh, they want, if you, you want to come and try to get a concession, you have to come and get it in front of all the other members. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also think it's, a, it's sending a signal we're going to do this as long as it takes. You know, you have a division in the Republican Party that you're seeing today is not a new one. Uh, the Freedom Caucus and, and those who are Freedom Caucus adjacent have been trying to take down the leadership on almost every meaningful vote mm -hmm. for the last 10 years. This is the same fight you've seen before. Ironically, most of what unites that Freedom Caucus group is budgeting. They, they care about fiscal matters sure. and budgeting. They have a, their, their disagreements with leadership may be disparate beyond that. 
But in doing this, they're really going to reduce the power of any Republican speaker to negotiate on a CR, uh, which is probably the only thing that can become law this year. Uh, uh, continuing resolution for those. I mean, yes. I, I try hard not to get the, the uh, Washington so speaker the, in the, here. The budget is the only thing that's going to happen, probably. I, it, it, it is funny that these guys are holding out for that, right? Like, this is what, and I understand it. For those that care, I, I get it. But it does seem a bit arcane to essentially just let the party get pummeled and humiliated yeah. on live television. Over a bunch of rules that nobody understands. Yes. This Robert, is all, Rob, it's, it's like arguing over Robert's Rules of Order. All, it's all, like a bad condo association. And, yeah, everybody talks like, you know, process stories. Yeah. This is the ultimate process story. Nobody cares what the rules are governing, how many amendments you're going to get, who's on what committee. What's the motion it's to vacate silly. number? <laughs> yeah, exactly. but, but some people run for Congress to start to do something. Some people run to stop something. And if you're getting ready for Congress to stop something, this is, this is doing we something. We all know. Anybody that's run any, if you've ever been involved in an organization that has to use Robert's Rules of Order, there's always somebody who just enjoys using Robert's Rules of Order. Yeah. They yeah. don't care about anything else. Although I think that's the scary thing. First, on, on, I agree with Brad, which is I think if Kevin McCarthy is running around trying to negotiate, that's a sign of weakness, yeah. right? That he's the one so who's saying him come, I'm but, willing yeah. to, you know, you've made your point, I'm willing to capitulate. Yeah. I think it's over. Then he's done and they will see smell blood in the water. I do think the thing that's pretty scary for the country is this is a non, this is an issue that doesn't matter to the American people. Like, they're not going to remember this. What happens when we get to things that that the Freedom Caucus, MAGA Republicans, really care about. They, I mean, if they're not willing to capitulate on this where there is an opportunity for unity, why are we not breaching the debt ceiling? By the way, I want to talk about some things this is stepping on today. A big thing is the Republican Party's current frontrunner is being inaugurated for a second term in Tallahassee today. Mm -hmm. Leanne, uh, it's Ron DeSantis. By the way, if you've not seen it, I mean, they are dressed for their inaugural. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think it was for the one in Tallahassee today. I mean, <laughs> family looked great. That looked like a... That looked like a group of people ready for their next gig, not necessarily this. Uh, but, you know, for better or for worse, whatever you think of Ron DeSantis, you know, in the world of politics, that's been stepped on completely. Yeah, and another thing that's interesting is how irrelevant Donald Trump is in this debate as well. Didn't he well. make calls on behalf of McCarthy? Yes, he did. That worked out. Yeah, so so it's really interesting, these internal Republican politics that's happening in the House of Representatives. How much does it mirror what's happening in the Republican Party moving forward? Because the party is a, at an inflection point. Yes, these are the same debates that the, com the party has had for the past 10 years. This is Tea Party, Freedom Caucus type stuff. But now the party is trying to figure out what it is going to be. Mm -hmm. On the other side of the Capitol, you have Mitch McConnell, who is the longest serving Senator, Senate leader as of today. Guess where he's going to be tomorrow? With I Joe Biden. Well, with Joe Biden <clears throat> touting the infrastructure bill and a, bill and a bridge I, in Kentucky. I'm going to let all, everybody call me an elitist all you want. Tomorrow's a meeting of the grown-ups, it feels like. You have Mitch McConnell, Mike DeWine, Andy Bashir. Sharon Brown. You know, share, <laughs> share, you know, people that are like, well, we don't always get along, but we have to get some stuff done. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, two governors who have had, you know, had to buck their own party at times and things like this. It's an interesting split screen tomorrow. And Mitch McConnell is very aware that the party has an image of being very unserious. Mm -hmm. And he's tried to make that point since the last election that we need to change our image. And he wants to show that you can actually get things. Like, he thinks this is a clown show because that's what it looks like. And he's trying to do whatever he can to show that this party is serious. It's a losing battle right now, but somebody has to do it. Brad, look, uh, you, you work for somebody that wanted to challenge McConnell, but Scott backed off. Well, I think the Senate is really three groups of people. You have about 15 to 16 to 17 members who are strongly loyal to Mitch McConnell. You have 15 to 18 members who are dissatisfied with his leadership. And the other 15 to 18 are kind of up for grabs on a vote-to-vote -vote basis. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the, the Senate Republican conference, as a result, is going to be very different as a minority this Do time. Do you think so? I think that they will be united against the president when he's on ideo ideological grounds. But I'm not sure you'll see the cohesion that you've seen in, in, in past Congresses. I think most senators are happy for Mitch McConnell to have achieved what he did today and become the longest serving leader. They think he deserves it. They think he earned it. But I think they're now going to have a pretty high bar for him articulating what comes next. Yeah. The real spl split screen, really, I think today is a, a debut of the rest of the next two years, which is the House versus Joe Biden running around the country. You know, they're really big investments they've made over the last two years. This bridge uh, announcement in Kentucky is not going to be the last. Of oh, these this is their whole plan for the first six months Absolutely. of 23, right? Every week they want to be unveiled. Well, asphalt's, right. asphalt's always bipartisan, though. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> well, but this is the point. You're going to have the contrast with them not, you know, yeah. I mean, they're very likely going to have these votes going while he's in Kentucky. No, it's, it, it, it's a weird moment, and McConnell will do his stoicism because this is, that's, <laughs> that's what he does. But 
it is inadvertently handing Biden a nice picture tomorrow. And look, Biden has all kinds of opportunities for the next two years, and we saw it with Barack Obama mm -hmm. in, 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 20, in 2012 and, and going back to, to Bill Clinton, Republican overreach in the House. And as soon as we organize and we actually get committees, we start doing investigations, yeah. there's a very good chance that we over, overreach, end up in some kind of crazy impeachment hearings, and he'll be able to ride that contrast to, yeah. to re-election. By the way, what would, you get, what, would you, what would Ryan be doing with Santos right now? Probably the same thing that they're doing, get through this moment, and then you hand it over to the ethics uh, committee to, to come down to some ruling and then use that as the precursor for kicking them out. Would you try to oust them, only, Brad? Only five members have ever been ousted. Yeah. Yeah, you, 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 or do you try to convince them to resign and run again? That's what, look, well, I, I don't want them to run again. Right. What you, well, well, but I, if I, the way I would convince him to resign is saying, hey, if you want a shot at actually holding the seat long term, do it now and show that you're remorse. Well, we had a lot of people, a handful of people resign. And yeah. it, it's usually what you do is you bring them in and you show them the options that exist before them. Yeah. And they come to the right conclusion. The Ethics Committee can dock him an enormous fine. And it doesn't seem like he actually has that kind of money. And that's usually why they leave is right before Ethics Committee is going to get them. Mm -hmm. They say, I'm out of here because then they lose jurisdiction. I, know, but I think this is a really big missed opportunity for Republican leadership because there's the ethics thing, which might actually be a real legal problem for him. There's just the shamelessness and outright lying. And for Kevin McCarthy, Jim Jordan, Scalise, not to say, hey, this is unacceptable. We might not be able to do anything, but you, you should and not I, be I think doing will. this. I think you, it, just, you, it sounds like you would be what Valadeo said. Hey, hey I, I want to, you know, absolutely. we can't do it. The court says we have to seat them, but sound like you don't want them there. The only I, reasons yeah. for people being expelled are being convicted of bribery or being yeah. a Confederate Democrat in 1861. That's it. That's the only reasons people have been. But I'm we don't know where this guy's money came there. from, but it could be a very nefarious thing. There, there, has, I mean, to be, yeah. there has to be accountability. Yes. Yeah. You can't That's right. lie your way to a seat of Congress and then just skate on it. So at some point, whether it's but be due resigning, process. yes, but at some point, but I you think can't the, just wait two years. The for silence it. for McCarthy right now just sends what message? You can do anything when I need your help to get power, right? Because why well, not say something right now? A lot of Republicans right aren't even focused on Santos yeah. right now. There's no there's, I, I asked a lot of Republicans about this. What do you think Look, McCarthy should do? And they're, they're like, what? They're like, half of them didn't even know beyond the you know, Here's the irony. Happening. All of Washington was wondering if McCarthy could get votes. <laughs> if anybody was talking about politics anywhere else in America, it was like, did you see this weird <laughs> Santos story? <Yeah. laughs> right? Like, it was sort of the... Talkable holiday story. The New York Times missed yeah. this story for a year, so the Republicans in the House can be excused for missing it for a few <laughs> so, days. So did, so did Democratic right. opposition research. I, I get to let you guys go here a couple minutes early. What a terrific panel. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. uh, before I hand things off, though, I want to bring in Steve Kornacki. He's been doing some stuff at the board uh, over at our sister channel. Uh, and here we are. So what are we up to now? we got 20 total members that have not voted for Kevin McCarthy on one of three ballots now, correct? Yeah, we've got 19 who've yep. done it on three of three. And Byron Donald, you can add him. He initially got a vote in the first round of voting from Chip Roy of Texas. And now Byron York actually is joining with Chip Roy, voted for Jim Jordan on this one. Byron uh, Donald yeah. now. So it's 20 now. All 212 Democrats continuing to vote. That's key. If, if all the Democrats continue to stay right. for these votes, show up and vote for Hakeem Jeffries, it means that on any given ballot, the maximum number of defections right. is five that uh, McCarthy and, can afford. And, and Steve, look, you know these districts as, as well as anybody. And I went through this with Brad Todd on the we did a, on the back of the of, of all the 20. He thinks only uh, Luna. Is it a, a district that's even remotely competitive? The Florida member of Congress, who's actually a, a congresswoman elect uh, during the remap, sort of in the Tampa Bay area. But everybody on this list is somebody that wins with 15, by 15, 20, 30 points at, at times. There's not a real competitive member on there. Yeah, I mean, you got Lauren Boebert, who had the sure, incredibly well, close right, race in but Colorado. That was a, but that but, was her, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but by and large, yes, you're talking about safe Republican seats. You're talking about, hey, you know, Keith Self from Texas is an interesting one here. This is, a, he's a former Collin County judge. Van Taylor was the Republican incumbent, sort of more of a moderate Republican. Remember, Van Taylor yeah. had voted for the bipartisan January 6th <laughs> commission. He seemed to beat Self in the primary. Then there was a personal scandal yep. last year involving Van Taylor. Self gets in, Self a much more Trump aligned, and that's what you end up seeing here. So we are heading towards the fourth vote now. You could see the last time this thing went past yeah. one round was 1923, took nine rounds. If it's worth anything in terms of precedent in 1923, it was after four rounds that they called it a day. So...
So what you're saying is at least these folks may be able to get a good night's sleep. <laughs> if they follow the 23 precedent, they would go one more round, then they would stop. That one took three days, and on the ninth ballot, Gillette yeah. got what he needed. Well, Pretty Steve, if years. only we were around 120 years ago, because the, the House had all sorts of action in the eight, from about 1880 to 1920. Uh, a, a lot of crazy stuff was happening then. Steve Kornacki, always good to get your uh, facts on the air. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.